I'm going to do one long thing. I'm going to do uh, a couple, each one significant, but a little bit shorter. Just some nice, uh, nice insights into the parsha. Um, <clears throat> so there's a very famous Rashi right at the beginning of the parsha but on the passage of Yitzhi Yaakov and Beersheva, Ve'yil So it talks about the journey of Yaakov. He had to leave town. Obviously, he was concerned from his brother, so his uh, parents sent him away. It says that Yaakov uh, went out of Beersheva and he went towards Charon. When I Beersheva went to Charon. Beersheva is a little bit south of Eretz Yisrael. Um, about a, let's say it's an hour or so south, a little bit south, uh, southeast. Yishlein. South, what? Of Yishalayim, yeah, exactly. And then much further north is Haran, which is somewhere near Syria. It's much, much further north. But at the end of the day, Rashi says famously as follows, All I needed to write was that Yaakov went to Haran. Why is it the adventure where he left from? Why is it significant? It teaches us that when a tzaddik leaves the city, it makes a roshem, which really means it causes a void. There's something lacking in the city when the tzaddik leaves. When the tzaddik is in the city, he's its glory, its shine, its, its luster. When he leaves from there, the city lacks and loses all these things. So to over there, when they left the city, it caused a great void. So there's a lot of uh, insights on this particular Rashi. Uh, one of the more famous of which is... Wait, is it that says Naomi and Rus? Yeah. What? Not only Malach. He mentions Naomi and Rus in Rashi. Huh? By Naomi and Rus, I mean, he mentions their name. Right, not, not only Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Which is an interesting point. Mm-hmm. Which will be somewhat relevant to what I'm about to say. Is that um, the Meforshim um, ask that we know that Avram left cities and Yitzhak left cities. Mm-hmm. So why don't we have a Rashi by Avram or Yitzhak or Noah before them or even Adam or Rishon, they're all great people, that says when a tzaddik leaves the city, it causes a great void. Why did the Torah wait until Yaakov Avinu, that by Yaakov Avinu, when Yaakov left the city, it created a great void? And there's many, there's dozens and dozens of answers to address this question, exactly why specifically waited until Yaakov Avinu. One of which was that Yitzhak was still there. So you might think wow. to say, if there's no tzaddikim left in the city, that's a great void. But if you leave behind the Yitzhak Avinu, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about it so much. So Afal Pekin, it says that no, each one has their own unique contribution, and therefore it created a void. Um, the answer that I usually fall back upon, which uh, makes the, uh, is most meaningful to me, I don't remember who said it. I saw it in a Likud Sefer called Mishulchan Gavo, which many of you have probably seen. Uh, but he quotes the following answer, and he says like this, the Torah only says chidushim. The Torah doesn't tell us things that we know already. And that's actually an important use when it comes to kol Torah kula. If you think something's pasha, it can't be that pasha. There has to be some layer, some meaning, some depth to it. That's some chidush, because the Torah wouldn't bother speaking to us if we knew that already. So, so too over here, the Torah is telling us a chidush. That when a tzaddik leaves the city, it makes a void, it causes, makes a reshem, the hod of the ziva hadar is lacking. The Torah didn't have to tell us that by Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu at the time was, was the Melech. Literally, he was seen in the eyes of Chazal as being a king. He was extremely wealthy, extremely influential. He had won that war with the four and five kings. The whole world knew about Avram Avinu. His name is ser- seriously one from one end of the world to the other. And therefore, to s- tell us that when Avram Avinu leaves the city, it's a big loss, that's not a Chiddush, and we don't need to have a Pasuk or a Rashi to teach us that particular lesson. Yitzhak Avinu also was the Velt Tzadik. He was the Gadol Hador. And therefore... Oh, um, he was the God of the door. And therefore, there was no need in, for the Torah to tell us that if Yitzhak Avinu would leave a city, it caused a Roshan, creates a void. Simply put, because everyone knew the great Sidkis of Yitzhak Avinu. He was well known, he was out there, even though the Torah doesn't display so many stories about him. And therefore, the Torah doesn't need to tell us that, by the way, Yitzhak Avinu would leave a city, it creates a void. Yaakov Avinu was the Yoshev Ohalim. Each time Yoshev Ohalim. He was sitting in the corner of the base Magic learning Tyre. And he was underappreciated in terms of the contribution that he made to the spiritual level of the cities that he lived in. Asa was the one who was out there, he was the Isha Sada. But Yaakov Avinu was sitting in the corner, he was in German, he was a Kolo fellow. So if I would tell you that Rudai uh, Doshor, Tari First, Ramachan Levin, you know, God forbid, are all leaving the city, we would all be up in arms. These are the leaders of our city, the Manhigim of our city. How can we go ahead and go forward without having these people in our city? If I would tell you that there's a, there's a chashva in your man in the Chicago community, Kailo, and you decided to move out of town, you would say, okay, you know, you win some, you lose some. We'll find a new one. Yeah, we'll find a new one, exactly. There's no, surely we'll find a new one. But, uh, you know, what's the big deal? Let's say, let's say even the Kailo said, you know, we're downsizing from, you know, 14 families to 13. No, no, 14 to 13, what's the big deal? 
And therefore, the Torah has to tell us that, by the way, you don't necessarily appreciate the impact of the Kolol fellow, the guy who's sitting in the corner of the base measure learning Torah, but you need to know when Yaakov left the city, there's a major void that's created by his absence. And that is what the Rashi had to teach us. Avram was no Chiddush and Yitzhak was no Chiddush. The Chiddush was that Yaakov Avinu and his contributions were so major that even when he leaves the city, I think the end of the Rashi is significant because talking about Naomi and Ruas, it's Lav Nafka Yaakov Avinu. It's everyone on their own level is making a contribution to the city. You des- don't necessarily get to see what you're doing. Sometimes you have a leadership role, which is uh, quite obvious. You're out there being MCs at dinners, right? You know, whatever uh-huh. it is. No, but, the po- <laughs> but the point being is that you have quite obvious leadership roles, but people underestimate the day to day activities that they have, they underestimate passing the Nisyanos in their day-to-day lives, they underestimate their own Torah learning, their own chesed, their own tefillahs, their own contributions to Kaisal in a spiritual sense, and they need to realize that this is all making a major impact, whether you see it or not. And if one would leave town who was making this positive impact, that creates a void uh, in the city. My mind reminds me of uh, my brother-in-law, my wife's sister's husband, very, very chash with Right now he's, uh, he's a Rebbe in one of the in a yeshiva in Philadelphia, not the Philadelphia yeshiva. They opened up a, a new yeshiva there. But at his Sheva Brachas, his Sheva Brachas were on Purim. And my brother-in-law was the top guy in yeshiva. And he also had aspirations to possibly go out to Kiruv, to do some Kiruv work. He's a very charismatic personality, and he really had both paths open in front of him. And uh, both of them are great. No one was denying the greatness of both paths, but uh, becoming a Rosh Hashiva, becoming a Magid Shir, um, was more what he should have been doing with his life. So his Rebbe came to Sheva Brachas, his Amperm. I still remember he took out a huge glass of wine, he, he chugged it down to get him ready for the speech. And he <laughs> says, the, he looks around there and he says, Is your Yisachar friend in the room? Which was actually possible because this was Yeshiva Sinai Yisrael on campus. So he might have been in the room. So he wasn't in the room. So he said, I want to ask a question. He says, who made a greater contribution to Jewish history? The Chazanish or Rabbi Yisachar friend? That was the question that he posed. And he said, it's not knocking a friend. He said, but let's get things straight over here. <laughs> let's get things straight over here. He says, there's no shayla in the world. The Chazanish's contribution to Jewish history is much greater than Rabbi Yisachar friend, despite the hundreds of thousands of people. This is a priest in Mashas. So at the time, it was probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Now it's you know, the millions of Jews that have heard of Rabbi Yisachar friend and who have literally directly had an impact from every friend. One can't deny the greatness of it, but still the Chazanish's impact is far greater than what the Rabbi Yisachar friend ever did. And he says, so too, Yossi. He says, instead of you going out to Kansas City, he says, stay in the base measures, bring Kansas City to you. He said, you don't have to go to Kansas City to influence Kansas City. You can influence Kansas City by staying in the base medrash and sitting learning Bahasmada or teaching your shiurim and that kayak and that power and that energy will get this incident into to Kansas City. It'll happen. You don't have to worry about it. So he said, with your personal cultures and your abilities, you know, I don't feel that you are cut out to go into Kiruv. I think you should stay in the base medrash to become uh, the biggest tamachachim you could become. But that's the yisod that we're talking about. It's not putting down any of the other things that we said. It's more that to appreciate the spiritual energy that you're creating uh, by Lima Natara and by Torah and mitzvahs. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a world that you can't see Ruchnius. But just like if the power plant would go out and we'd be in a blackout right now, you physically see the darkness. So too, if uh, Torah learning is not happening and Torah mitzvahs are not happening, it's a Ruchnius dick of blackout. So you can't see with your eyes, but you have to try to be as attuned as possible to what's happening and try to realize that in terms of appreciating others, Torah and mitzvahs, and certainly when it comes to appreciating your own, to try to take it up a notch um, to increase the energy of your ruchnias that you're contributing to the world. Uh, I would just say one nakuda, because we are uh, certainly all listening to the news and watching the news and nervous about what's happening, and you know, what can we do to make a difference? So this is the easiest thing to do, is that these are kaychas of tumma in the world. Hashem is only allowing these uh, groups and these individuals to stay strong and to latch on and to be doing what they're doing because there's a power of tumma that's coming into the world. We're not going out to the battlefront, and I definitely don't recommend that, but our battlefront is in the world of ruchinus. And the more we can somehow take it up a notch, and step it up, and to increase our limit of Torah, or focus on limit of Torah, or to daven better, do more chesed, and in a ruchniistic ascent, energize the world, and make kedushin into the world, then we'll be much better off. And that's our way to battle those kokos, because uh, I don't expect any of us to physically be waging the war, so at least wage the war uh, on a ruchniistic level. So that's just the one ha'ar I wanted to share. Um, on this Pasuk and this Rashi Beit Yaakov Be'er Shava is that the Torah had to say a dafka by Yaakov because Avram and Yitzhak wouldn't have been a Chiddush. Everyone knows when they leave town it's a big deal. But Yaakov, we wouldn't necessarily know that. We wouldn't necessarily appreciate that he leaves town. Okay, fine. You know, we, win some, we, win some, we win some, we lose some. And therefore Rashi feels a need to tell us, by the way, no. Also, when he leaves town, major void and major loss and we should uh, all be very upset about the void that was created by the Talmud Chacham who leaves town. That's our number one. Uh, har number two, um, I just saw last night in the Sefer by Rabbi Yitzhak David Frankel. He's the Rav 
of the Aguda of, uh, of Cedarhurst. Um, I happened to have, I spoke in his shul this past Elul, and he gave me his set of svarim as a gift. So uh, I saw him at the Aguda convention last week, and he asked me if I use it, which I actually did use it once, but I felt it was an ex- extra push to, uh, <laughs> to take a look at it again. So uh, he had a beautiful word on this week's, on this week's parasha. So I mentioned earlier that uh, Be'er Sheva and Yushalayim are not that far apart from each other, but Haran was much further north, much further north. And there's a lot of versions of the story. You look at the Ramban in terms of like where he traveled from where to where, and where was the ladder, and, and the bottom of the ladder, the top of the ladder, the middle of the ladder. There's a lot of Mahalfin, but according to the simple understanding was is that he traveled from Be'er Sheva, he passed Yushalayim, he got to Haran, and then he's, oh my gosh, I passed the place where my forefathers Davin, I didn't Davin, and then he said he had a desire to go back to the Machama Mikdash, and the Torah tells us, and the Chazal teaches us, there was a kafitz zaderech that somehow either the, the earth contracted or he himself walked very quickly, and he got to Yushalayim very quickly to be able to dive in there. And it sounds like also from the Mephorshim, they actually got a kafitz zaderech to go back to Charon um, afterwards to uh, find a wife and to work for Lava and to marry Rachel and Leah. So Ray Frankel's question was, you know, it's one thing if you like you miss your stop on the highway and you go one exit further, you go two exits further. Charon is hundreds of miles away from Yushalayim. I mean, he walked, you know, one day, let's say, to get from Be'er Sheva to Yushalayim, and then, like, two weeks to get from Yushalayim to Haran, and then he has, oh, I missed it. I forgot. You know, yeah, I missed, I forgot. You know, usually if you realize you missed your exit, then, uh, you know, my brother just told me he was going, supposed to be going east on the highway, and he went west for an hour. So, <laughs> that so was worse, annoying. Worse. So it does happen sometimes. But at the same time, it just doesn't seem logical that he would completely forget until he gets to Haran. Or Har- something happened. Yeah, or some, or, or, or I mean, the question is, or did something trigger Dafka then? Mm-hmm. Meaning, but otherwise, if it's simply like, oh, just it dawned on him, then why did he wait to dawn on him so much later? You would think that he would have caught on uh, much earlier. Mm-hmm. Where did all of us attend? Where, along the way? Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's why I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, but when you're, when you're, I'm, I'm, I'm sure when you're approaching... Right? Basner, right? Yeah, yeah I, remember, I remember I used to visit in Cincinnati. I'm sure when you approach uh, Yerushalayim, it's, it's not like there's all these houses there back then. You know what I'm saying? Everything built there's around now. Like, you know, I'm saying, and like, I'm sure it's like, it's there. It's in your face. It's like hard to forget. How do you miss it at all? You know, now you're walking by, like, you don't think about it. You look at the shawarma place yeah. and this other place. Yeah. yeah, I never thought about it this way, because back then they didn't have highways, so I figured, like, everyone just took their own route. So when I was in AirW taking a tour, you know, the tour guide points to one of the tops of the mountains and says that we assume that's the place where Avram and Yitzhak stood when they first saw Har Maria. Because he says that is the direction towards Hebron, and that was the route that they took. So there were like routes. It wasn't like you know highways or you know, interstate highways, but there were Mahalchem in general that they took. So you would think also like he kind of saw Yerushalayim, unless Yerushalayim didn't have a city at all back then. It was just the Mak of Mikdash without anything around it. You know, I don't know. Oh. If you think it was built up at all? It could be just as an open field. You know, a mountain. But where, something where was the Shemesh Aver. It was not. It was not Yerushalayim. I think. Right. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's. You know, you're talking about 14 years, from the time he left right. until here, you know what I'm saying, there's a 14 years gap yeah, also. So, exactly. Who knows? There's a lot of time. Maybe he didn't have to appreciate it until after. Still a good question. Yeah, so every Frankel's suggestion That's is like more this. of a question then. Exactly, maybe, yeah. Maybe it's not that he forgot, but maybe possibly he should stop. But later... He realized. He, so that would... That would yeah, so this, this would fit into what I'm saying, what you're saying, that he definitely didn't stop until he had to stop, until he got to the destination. He said, maybe I should go back. So Ray Frankel says like this. He says that uh, we know that um, Yaakov was preparing for many years to go out to Haran. Uh, it's well known that he spent 14 years in Shiva Shemba Ever, like you just mentioned. And uh, there's a lot of you know, approaches to discuss why he definitely went to Yeshiva, why did he go to that Yeshiva, why did he have to learn from him, what did he learn from them that he couldn't learn from his own father, what was so unique about that experience. And the Tzad Shava, the common denominator of most of the Mahalchim is, is that uh, there was a unique type of Torah that he needed to learn from Shemba Ever, which at the time Shemba was no longer alive, but his grandson Ever was, was the Torah's Chutzlaretz, was the Torah of dealing with Yerushayim, that he, at the time, had been learning from his father, Yitzhak Avinu, but that was just a pure, unadulterated Torah that had no understanding of the, necessarily the world around them and Yerushayim and conniving people and deceitful people. But Shem, who lived in the world pre mabel and saw what people can, you know, bring themselves down to, and they, the Stamazai were not, they were a little more out in the world, they had more of an understanding of people and human nature and how to deal with them, that uh, Yaakov even felt that he was going to spend time with Lavan, who was known as the most deceitful person in the world, he already had his reputation going across the world, he has to prepare himself, he has to learn a special type of Torah, Torah Schutzaretz, Torah of dealing with the people around him, and therefore he went to the yeshiva, and when he left yeshiva after 14 years, on top of the many, many years of learning Torah by his father, he felt equipped and he felt ready to go. He got to Haran, says Rabbi Frankel, and he says, I'm not ready for this. 
as much preparation as I did, and there are many situations in life where you prepare for the great event, and when you get the great event, you're like, this is not what I expected, or this is much more than I expected. I'm just not ready for this yet. The muscle that he gives is you take a farmer from Omaha who's traveling to New York City for the first time ever, and they plan their vacation, and they get all their brochures, and they plan their day, but all of a sudden they get to New York, and they come out of the subway in Times Square like, Whoa, the, you know, you can't even on internet and with pictures and videos, you can't capture just how overwhelming the experience is until you actually get into it. So he wants to suggest that maybe Yaakov Avinu, despite all his preparation, when he got the Khar and he's like, whoa, this is much more than I expected in terms of the Tumah of the people that he was dealing with, the Tumah of the environment that he was in. And he says, I need a little bit more time in the Makkah Mikdash. And that's when he decided to go back to Yerushalayim. He went back to Yerushalayim, he had a Kfisa Zadarach to go back to Yerushalayim, he was recharged one more time by building a connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and asking for the last ingredient they didn't have, which was Siyat HaDashmaya, of Davin to Hashem. My avos, my father, my grandfather, Davin here for Siyat HaDashmaya, for assistance and everything they did. He says, I need to come back for a recharge, I need to come back for Davin for Siyat HaDashmaya. And then he went to Charan, and then he was as ready as he could be. So I think the Musr lesson from that is quite obvious, is that there are many times in life, actually, I should say, always in life we should prepare, but there are some times in life, despite all your preparation, when you get into it, you realize, I'm just not ready yet. And it's not a bad thing to sometimes go back for a recharge, or even in the middle of the process, if you feel that it's chipping away at you, to go back for the recharge that's necessary, you mechazik yourself again to push on forward. So I just thought it was a very nice lesson that he was able to draw out from this, and his suggestion that, you know, sat very well with me, this idea that when he got to Haran, he was ready to stand for him. He passed me on the great basin and said, that, I don't need to stop. But when he got there, he realized he needs a little more siyat to a little more chizik, he went back, he gathered his chizik, then he pushed forward, and he was as successful as he was. And we see, you know, Baruch Hashem, as difficult as Nisayim was, he was extremely successful in Haran. He came out with uh, four wives, 12 shvatim, and uh, a uh, clean slate in terms of the way he conducted himself during that turn, the entire time of, uh, you know, Tariq uh, Mitzvah Shamarti, that he kept Kola Tarakula without a single flaw the entire time throughout the process. So something very, very unique. Rabbi Finkel does point out that we know that when he came back to the Makkum Mikdash, Vayifka by Makkum, he was Masaki Marif. And that just fits very nicely because Marif is the tefillah of Gullus, the tefillah of darkness, the tefillah of when things are hard and there's challenges to it. That Dafka, when he realized this is going to be extremely dark and extremely challenging, that's when Marif came out because that's the Yisod of what he's trying to accomplish um, under these circumstances. So that just that was another very nice, uh, very nice Nakuda, very nice Yisod. So um, another Ha'ara. As the Patsik says, Vayifka by Makam. Vayifka by Makam. He came to the place, Vayal and Sham, he slept there. And like I just said a minute ago, he's Masaki Mariv. And then he goes on and he comes across these shepherds. And he says to them, Lo Ace, hey Yosef Amikna, it's not time to be gathering in the sheep. You know, there's the Oda Yom Gadol, there's a lot more time to the day. You know, you don't do this now, go back out to the fields. He says, No, we just want to feed the, you know, we'll feed the sheep. We can't get the rock off the top of it. He's like, I'll help you out, and that's fine. So just a couple interesting ha'aras. So I have a chaver, um, his name is Michal Berkowitz, uh, his father is uh, my Rebbe, C. Berkowitz in Yisrael. So he had a chiddush, and he actually asked his father this, and he thinks that Yonason Ebeshet says this chiddush. Why were they at the well in the middle of the day? If that's not normal, it's still right in the middle of the day, no, they normally only come back at the end of the day. So why were they by the well in the middle of the day? Like, what were they doing there? Like, that's not the minig. The minig is spend a whole day out on the field. Usually when it came to farmers or shepherds, they hopped around the whole day. They got up at dawn because they could only work during the day. They didn't have lighting out there. So they had to take advantage of every second of daylight. So why were they back there in the middle of the day? What was going on over here? So he says, well, think about what happened yesterday. What happened? Kodesh Baruch Hu says, I can't let this tzaddik pass by the Mokka Mikdash without him sleeping in there. So he caused the sun to set early. So the next day, the shepherd says, maybe it's going to happen again. <laughs> so they brought in the shepherd. They don't want to get caught in the middle of the field, in the middle of the dark. So what they did was, it says, I don't know, maybe there's a new pattern over here. The sun sets two hours earlier than expected. So he said to them, don't worry. It's not time to gather in the sheep. That was just yesterday. That was a special deal. It's not going to happen again. You don't have to worry about it. So I just thought it was a good chap in terms of what's going on in the story over here, uh, why they did it. My little ha'ara that I want to add, uh, I never bounce this off anybody, but uh, you could uh, judge it on your own, is that it's interesting to note that in Mishnais, as a machlekes, uh, when's the time to daven marif? To the reunion and the chacham. One sheet is you can already start from plak. The other sheet is you have to wait until shkia. Like, why is it that all of a sudden marif, you get daven during the day? So I want to say, possibly, that when were we masake marif? The takana of marif was in this story. He davened the first marif ever, in darkness during the day. It was really daylight hours that were borrowed for night. 
So maybe the reason why there's this machodz b'chal, like where does this come from, that you can count it as night already, an hour and 15 minutes, halachic minutes before nighttime. So maybe the reason why you could do that is the original marv that we had was technically dark, but it was borrowed from daylight hours. So maybe you could say that's the reason why we have this b'chal. You know, I'm just uh, looking at the Hanukkah right now, that you have to light the menorah after shkia for sure, the different shkia is when you light it. But in a case of need, you can light from plug. One second, it's still the previous day of Hanukkah. How can I light the seventh candle of Hanukkah on the sixth day? No, for, in the eyes of Halakha, we already have this, this bridge that was created by Yaakov Avinu, that the original Marv, the original Lila of Marv, was created during daylight hours. It belonged to daylight, but at the same time, it was actually dark outside. So perhaps that's what was happening over here. And then famously, a lot of Mepharshim point out that it's just interesting, Bechlal, that when Yaakov saw the shepherds, he's giving them Musar. You know, like, you don't, it's hard enough for me, who has relationships with people for a long time, to give a, a word of Musa. All of a sudden, these are complete and utter strangers. He comes up to them and says, what are you doing? Uh, it's not the time now. You're stealing from your boss. Get out of the fields again. How is he doing such a thing? And uh, it's the same you so just said from two different angles. But Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says this, and other before say it as well, is that that's why he starts off with the whole conversation. Achai, my dear brothers is that he dafka wanted to be able to talk to them, but he understood that this is so zemes. You can't give Musa and Tofaka to strangers. So he warmed up to them first, my dear brothers, and he spoke to them a little bit, then he warmed them up, and he didn't realize that he was out for their own good. And then once they realized he was out for their own good, then he felt he had a little bit of room to start saying to them, by the way, it's not time to come in yet. And like we said before, that they were wrong altogether. They probably appreciated his advice, that he had the inside scoop, that the sun was not going to set early again. It's totally fine. You go out to the field, you have a couple more hours, and you come back in a couple hours and feed your sheep. Um, but at the same time, that's the little insight that they have over here, that in general, when it comes to giving Musa and Tochacha, you have to do whatever you can to create that, that warm and positive relationship, have them realize that you're looking out for their own good, and only at that point to give them any form of Musa and Tochacha. Otherwise, it's not the right thing to do. To buttress what you said. Yeah. I like <laughs> um, that's why they didn't have enough people. Right. Not everybody decided that today's going to be shorter. Right. Some people saw it. Yesterday was short. They come in early. Why were, every day they didn't have enough people to, to, to roll the rock. Today they didn't have enough people. Right. And maybe, like you said, only some people said, well, yesterday was short, we're coming in. But the other ones were there. Other said, ah, that was an anomaly, we're staying out. Interesting. No, maybe we have to help. Right. Interesting. I, I was just doing uh, Chumash with my daughter last night in, in uh, Parshas Dvarim, and Rashi there basically says this to Yisoyu when it comes to Tochacha, that why did um, Moshe Rabbeinu wait you know, to give the Tochacha to you know, the Klai Yisrael? He said he waited because he had to prove himself first to them that they wouldn't be turned off and say, oh, he's just giving us Tochacha. No, he won a few wars for them, he proved how much he cared about them, he led them into Eretz Yisrael, then he gave them some of the rebuke. And then Rashi references that so too by Yaakov Avinu, that Yaakov only gave the Shvatim Tochacha on his deathbed, because he was afraid they would be turned off and go off to Esav. And therefore he held off, he proved to them an entire lifetime how much he cared and loved them. And at the end he says, I have to give a little bit of Musa and Tochach, a little bit of direction in life. So obviously the lesson to us always is that uh, be extremely cautious when you give any rebuke or Musa. People, certainly in our generation, are, are, are hypersensitive when it comes to this issue. Yes, even by your kids. That, that, yeah, yeah, even by, yeah, even, even, even by your kids. kids. Even by your kids. Yeah, yeah you have to... And, right. and, the, right. and, 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 the and he was Yaakov Vino. <laughs> exactly. And, and, still and, and, they're gonna go, and they're going to go to Esau? Right. right. <laughs> right. That was the concern. So it just shows you how careful and how cautious you have to be. They, you know, the Pasuk says, right. that you should surely rebuke your brother, but don't get a sin from it. The Mepharshim classically say is that only do it if it's not going to backfire and you lead to more sin and just more you know, anger and more upset. And therefore, just one has to be very, very careful to do the right thing at the right time. And as the Gemara Yevamos, I believe, says, it's just like there's a mitzvah to say things that will be heard, there's a mitzvah not to say things that will not be heard, and you have to use your seichel to uh, do the right thing in life. Brother, I, I, I heard something.